Hello and welcome to the Friday Night Interviews with Cast Iron. Each week I'm speaking to a creative based in, working in, or just passing through Brighton. And this week we're speaking to Anna Burt. Hello Anna, how are you? I'm um, alright, thank you. Thanks for having me guys. How, um, how's it been for you the past couple of weeks? I know uh, when everybody anybody meets somebody for the first time in a while it's 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 never just a question of how are you it now has a real genuine import so yeah how are you how have you been coping um i found the last few weeks much harder than i have any other of the weeks um and i wonder if it's because things are i mean i never felt that things were particularly black and white but things just feel muddy and strange and political and sad and confusing a little bit and the weather's been a bit bad, which definitely affects the whole thing. And my workload has only increased, so it's not. So I just feel a bit, feeling a bit oppressed by it all. But also, I'm in a much better. You know, I'm grateful for my situation. But it, I've, the last few weeks, I think, have been have been difficult. Yeah, I think, as you say, because it seems that the dialogue, the narrative, is that we're going back to normal, but we don't quite know what that means, and it yeah. feels like we haven't. Possibly we haven't earned normality yet. It's like, oh, really? Or, you know, normality has been pushed off a cliff. Um, but yeah, tell me about about the work, your workload. Well, what is your day to day work? Um, so at the moment, I am the director of the Jericho Writers Summer Festival of Writing, which is a um, this is my sales pitch. It's just a three month um, writer focused festival with webinars, Q and A's, um, author interviews, um, and interactive workshops, um, all to support the writing community. So we've got um, we've sold over a thousand tickets in thirty six countries. So it's very global. It's the first time we've done it. I was actually brought on originally to. Um, to manage their physical festival of writing, which is called the York Festival of Writing, which is in the beginning of September. But obviously due to COVID, we had to bring that online. And um, so myself and my colleagues um, have been, pro you know, I programmed it and um, and it started in June. So we're now into the second month and it's been going really well. It's really enjoyable. We've pretty much got an event every day. So it can be quite exhausting, um, but it's really rewarding and it's bringing writers across the world together. So I love doing that. Um, then I work for Myriad Editions, local publisher extraordinaire, who publish um, literary fiction, graphic novels, and um, what else they publish? Um, feminist nonfiction. And I work um, in creative for Red Dog Books. I also am the host of um, the Brighton Book Club on Radio Reverb, so I've been doing that from home, which has taken me a lot longer than it takes me to record in the studio. So, um, so kind of fingers in a lot of pies, and trying to kind of maintain some kind of semblance of doing my own stuff but I've been quite bad at that recently. Well that, that's interesting because if your career if your work is within the written word and it's your passion and it's what you enjoy then your own work your own sort of thing that becomes that become blended into your everyday there's it's more difficult to see where the lines are between your professional life and your your life of pleasure. Completely I mean I think that's often a thing and often thing for writers who teach creative writing um, is that they are spending more time helping other people finish their books or critiquing other people's work than writing their own um, but I mean I do I love my work and I I don't think there's you know for me personally it's more important than anything to enjoy my work and I just need to pull my finger out and be more creative <laughs> so you've got to put your fingers into lots of pies but also got to pull your finger out to sort of look after your own pie <laughs> but I think I'm, I'm pushing the metaphor too much now I have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> But uh, okay, let, let's look at those sort of things. So the the Jericho Writers that was always going to be for the most part a digital festival. No, it was never going to be a oh. digital festival. So it was, it was going to be. Um, they run the festival York Festival of Writing, yeah. which is what what I was employed to to run. So I basically started in kind of February March programming for that, and then March came and they just said stop. Came back to me a few weeks later and was like, right, we want to bring it online. So the reality is that we've gone from three days um, and, you know, 300 people attend, physically attending the festival to three and a bit months and, um, you know, over over 1,100 people attending the festival with um, about 20 to 30 events per month. So it's kind of really increased in scale, but then also 
the digital nature of it actually makes it much easier to program for because you don't have to think about logistics like catering and accommodation and travel and all of those things that really get in the way of just planning. Yeah, yeah. So uh, tell me what uh, like an average day at that festival is going to be like with, as you say, the webinars and whatever. What, what would one expect if they're going to log on? Do you mean the physical festival? No, uh, because uh, I guess, frankly, because we don't have that at the moment. So yes, if I'm going to log on today or tomorrow, what do I think I might find? Well, I'm just trying to find my list of events, ah. actually, which I don't have in front. Oh, here we go. So um, this is June's list of events. Yeah. So, for instance, um, at the beginning of launch, we uh, of the month, we had a launch. Um, then there was a memoir write, writing workshop, a Q&A with Folio Literary Management, who was some of the biggest... Um, biggest agency in the States, um, avoiding common mistakes with a um, well-known literary agent, um, developing your crime novel, social media and branding, from draft to debut, ask us anything, in conversation with Claire McIntosh, developing your short stories, show don't tell, um, making money as a writer, you know, they're just some examples and so pretty much every day actually, bar two, in June and Sundays we had an event and it's yeah. the same for July, same for August and the beginning of September. And running through the festival is a competition called Friday Night Live where um, writers who are part of the festival can send in 500 um, words of their work in progress and we judge that and we whittle it down and at the end it's the winners chosen by two literary agents and quite often the Friday Night Live winner gets um, gets representation at the end of it Fantastic. by an agent which is fabulous so as you say it's very much a festival for writers around it's the... not a literary festival there are good great big literary names we've got neil gaiman and chris riddell at the end of the month which is yeah. fabulous but um i think literary festival can can often be quite inaccessible and quite limiting in their like literary journeys that they show i mean I would be very happy to organise literary festivals. I do like them, but there's something about a writing festival that just opens up so much more and goes into the craft and, and everything behind the process rather than just, here's me with my beautiful hardback book. Yeah, and I guess because you're sort of... Um immersed in that world with the um the publishing house as well um linked into the to the workshop you mentioned about mistakes that some aspiring writers or new writers might make um let's put a positive spin on that when you're like looking through do they still call it a slush, a slush pile? Yeah, they do. Yeah. It's quite old fashioned, but they do. Yeah. So when you're looking through that slush pile, what's What's actually going to hook you? What, 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 generally speaking, is going to make you read to page three, page four, page five? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, a really, really well-considered, well-thought-through covering letter that addresses the person that they want to see it, um, that acknowledges um, the list that the publisher has, why this publisher, um, perhaps even you know, kind of flattery. I like this book that you publish. I'd love to sit on this list. Um, this is why my book would work for you. Telling me why you're, um, you know, how you're aware of the marketing process, or at least you're trying to learn about it, any courses you've done, um, any, you know, any books you've recently read that you've really loved. I don't care about formal education or MAs or anything like that. I just want you to be good and personable and really, really have a good story in you. You know, even if, even if it needs a lot of work, if you can, if your kind of covering letter and your synopsis is engaging and good and your pitch is strong, you know, I'm hooked. We get so many submissions that just say, um, you know, dear editor or and dear editor's fine. I don't mind it too much, but dear sirs for all female companies. And um, I, you know, this is like a book that no one else has ever you know ever read before um i can't even it doesn't even have a genre you think well how am i meant to sell a book without a genre do you want me to create a genre for you you know it's not that easy um so if you can say this is my book it would sit next to this book and this book on a bookshelf if you like this tv program or this film you also might like it um i've done this course and this course and read this book um and i'm submitting you because um you published this book and this book then I'm going to be like, right, this person knows what they're doing. They've done their research. All the information is out there. And I would want to read on because they've spent the time submitting to the company. And therefore, we spend our time. Often, you don't get paid to read submissions. That's not in your working day. That's what you do in your unpaid time. So why should I spend unpaid time reading submissions that have been sent to millions of publishers where they don't even know what they do? You know, don't send me a children's book because we don't do children's books, you know? 
Yeah. So in your covering letter, if you were going to write and, and submit and you had the paragraph about what you've been reading recently, what mm -hmm. have you been reading recently? Oh, great question. Um, I've actually, at the beginning of lockdown, I couldn't read anything. And then I started, um, but I was writing and then I stopped writing and I started reading. Um, so I read, what have I been reading? I've read Outline by Rachel Cusk. Um, I have read, I'm reading, I read the, what's the book called? <laughs> just forgot the name of the book. But I've been reading Attica Locke's crime books, which are amazing. Um, and at the moment, I have just been sent by the publisher, Gender Explorers by Juno Roach, which is an amazing book. And I'm going to talk about it on the next podcast. Um, I've read Call Me By Your Name. I'm about to read. We Have Always Been Here by Samira Habib, um, which is a queer Muslim memoir. Um, I've been reading some short stories. Um, I'm about to read My Dark Vanessa because I'm interviewing the author at the festival. I've got Evie Wilde's The Bass Rock to, to read. Um, I've been watching quite a lot of telly. Yeah. What, what, what telly have you been watching? Um, I May Destroy You. Ah, yes. Have you seen I'm up to oh episode God. two so far, so I'm quite far behind. I've, I've not been watching it on the... Week. Is it up to episode eight now or something, or episode six, mm -hmm. I guess? Um, I just, just think it's amazing. I think Michaela Cole is incredible. I think it's raw and hard to watch, but really necessary. I've really enjoyed that. Um, I've been watching a lot of... Um, quite like comfort TV. I really like Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares, USA. <laughs> Fair, yeah. I watch, oh my gosh, Your Home Made Perfect. I love home improvement. Um, home is under the hammer if I'm sitting on the sofa doing some work. Do you know what I mean? Just like comfort, easy watching TV. Um, we've been watching some films. I watched the um, the new Will Ferrell Eurovision film. Yes. Yesterday, which was um, highly entertaining. Good. A couple of wines. Um, but just kind of been sitting, just sit, oh, Britain's Best Parent, which is fabulous trash just mm. not quite a lot of trash i love a bit of trash but we shouldn't assume that if we want to submit a novel to you that it should be about a young couple trying to build a new house for a limited budget that's not going to necessarily get under your radar oh what's the hook though there could be one the hook the hook is that the house is haunted by themselves now that twist's been done and there's also a dog that devours a chicken. Yeah, I mean, probably not for me. <laughs> there is a really good book, and again, I've forgotten the author, called The Upstairs Room, um, that is about a young couple that move into a house that needs, a youngish couple that move into a house that needs renovating, and the house kind of makes the wife ill, and it's very haunting and very beautiful. So, um, yeah, so that kind of got in my love of home renovation. And... Um, <laughs> and um great writing so um so you never know now, i've just started watching a norwegian series called blood ride which is like um a tales of the unexpected short story per half uh, episodes and the first one is um a young couple moving into a country how a uh, country estate where all the locals are very fond of their pets and it goes quite quick creepy quite quickly so that's um that's fun um, you were talking about uh, to-do lists and stuff, uh, and we were speaking just before the recording about to-do lists. How useful do you find them, or are they like a, a, a weight on your neck? If I didn't have a thousand to-do <laughs> lists at a time, so this is just my diary for today. Yes. This is the work that I'm doing today, and this is my list for the week. I would be completely lost. It looks like complete chaos but I um because I work for different companies um I would just I find it very hard to keep it all in my head you know if I have a thought it can instantly go if another email comes in so the only way that I can get by is having multiple lists well I'm enjoying that it's multiple lists of mul multiple books and different highlighters and stuff um I myself am too fond of like buying new books for to-do lists and stuff do you have unfinished stationary books or are you quite good at actually using them up i'm actually quite good at finishing them i'm just looking over i've got a shelf and i have like every single notebook that i've ever completed like, i can't I just can't throw them away you know they're archives um but i do finish them actually yeah. i'm really nearly at the end of one at the moment so i'm very excited oh. about starting a new one fantastic you were speaking also about the um the podcast um prepping for the podcast so tell me a bit more about that about the podcast 
Yeah, so the Brighton Book Club podcast was born in October 2019 um, and um, Radio Reverb asked me to do it for them. So Radio Reverb are a community run, radio, community run? community radio station based in the open market in Brighton um, and they were looking for a book show and um, I've been a big lover of radio and podcasts I listen to the radio all day every day um, I listen to many podcasts and I often find programs about books are quite inaccessible a bit snobbish definitely very straight definitely very white um, and I wanted to just do something and there's a really good community of people in Brighton and a really good writing community so I wanted to bring my kind of love of books and love of reading and um, the good writing community in Brighton together to um, in, a, in a radio show. So it's on, I do a show, it, it goes out once a month and is repeated throughout the months. Um, and often I have a theme. So in the past, we've done young adult fiction, short stories, music, crime, poetry, coming of age, love stories, all of those kind of thing. Um, I always try and include an emerging author, um, a more established author, a local author. And um, then we read a book, we, we discuss a book on the show as well. Um, and then sometimes I shake it up and we have things in between or if a local author's got a book launch we'll do some kind of shorter extracts on the podcast um but it's great it's an amazing experience and I love working for the radio station um and and the podcast you know seems to go down quite well there's a great community of writers and readers in Brighton so it's a real honor and a pleasure to be able to do it yeah it sounds fantastic and we've we've, we've listened to it it's a genuinely uh, lovely uh listen say lovely watch you know it a listening experience that sounds a bit more pretentious than I expected, um, but yeah, it, it, it's it's a good it's a good um, uh, listen. Um, I also uh, we we're speaking about writing. Uh, you were doing some writing in the lockdown and whatever, and I guess a lot of writers who also have to work for a living have been spending the past ten, fifteen years, or however long, two years, going. Oh, all I need is more time, and now. Mm -hmm we've been gifted or cursed with more time but we haven't necessarily been able to write more um d do we have guilt about this or do we celebrate this or well, what's the uh, solution if we've not actually been writing as much as we always said we would if we had the time hmm. well i think when we always when we thought about having the time we didn't assume that there would also be hundreds of thousands of people dying jobs being lost yeah family to worry about, income to worry about. So I think that where we may have more time, we have much less headspace and headspace is what you need to write, I think. So I just think if you're writing, that's great. If you're not, that's great. Um, my writing a lot depends on my mood and, you know, and my headspace. And to be honest, like I've just been, I've been I lost some work at the beginning. So I was quite anxious about that. And then I gained a lot of work very quickly. And so then I was anxious about that. And, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, if you're writing, that's great. And if you're not, that's also fine. Um, I just think the whole writing community, um, there's real potential to be kind and supportive to each other, but there's also potential to be quite competitive. Yeah. I've written this many words today. How many have you written? Or I've created this today. What have you done? Um, and everyone's situation is different. Some people can write 10,000 words a day and it's nothing. And they might be bad. They might be good. It doesn't really matter. And some people, you know, will take four months to do that, but they might be amazing or they might be bad. You you know, it's just everyone works at a different pace. And I feel like, um, you know, it, it kind of, the, it, it leaves me with an uncomfortable feeling, the kind of productivity myths, really, because it makes me feel like we're back at school and we're thinking, right, who's who's got to this, you know, when you don't, you'd read in stages, or well, who's got to this book and who's got to this book and who's got to this book? And people get left behind and it just doesn't seem fair. Like, I look at my brother, he couldn't really read till he was about 12, really dyslexic. He's now doing a master's in international development. He's the cleverest loveliest person I've ever I've no idea what he's talking about or writing about because it's completely over my head and at school you know he was just put, pushed down and pushed down and pushed down and just kind of put into the corner to, and told to stay quiet and I think it we you know there's a tendency as adults to kind of um to kind of fall back into those their kind of negative patterns of productivity and progress yeah talking about school what was the um what's the book you remember falling in love with at school do you do you have such memory in school yeah. Oh my gosh, it was Holes by Louis Satcher. Ah, yes, that's a good answer. That's that's. I loved it. I just love it, and I still love it. And I love the film. Yeah. And I love the book. Um. What else? Um. I actually the the books we read at school were, to be honest, pretty naff. Um. 
we did some Philip Larkin poetry when I was doing my A-levels, which I enjoyed. I like Philip Larkin. Um, you know, Shakespeare's fine. Yeah. I don't pick up Shakespeare and read Shakespeare for pleasure. I, I don't, to be honest, I don't think that many people do. Um, but I read for pleasure while I was at school. And there was a series of books called Beyond the Barricades, which was a love story set, um, young adult books in a series set in the Troubles in Ireland between an, a, a Catholic and a Protestant boy and girl and um and i just loved that they were so romantic and yeah. so um beautifully written and so exciting and so kind of like above my age i used to love them i read a lot of jacqueline wilson yeah. i loved jacqueline wilson i wasn't harry potter was i mean i mean now that's a different story but um but as a kid i wasn't i wasn't kind of mad for it as i got older maybe the first few books i read yeah maybe the first four when i was quite young and liked them but um but yeah, no, those books were really um, seminal. And then as I got older, I started reading. Um, we've had this conversation when you guys came on my podcast talking about coming of age books. Yeah. Um, you know, reading The Bell Jar and, and books like Catcher in the Rye yeah. and, you know, seeing yourself in younger protagonists. And I just, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of when I started loving reading, really. Well, a couple more. What were the book questions for? What's the uh, book you wished you'd written? Um. Postcards from the Edge by Carrie Fisher. Ah, excellent. Uh, I've, I've only read a bit of Carrie Fisher, but that's one I haven't read yet. Um, I've got um, a later, I've got, do you know what, I, I'm doing it in the wrong order. The next one on my shelf is Wishful Drinking. Uh, so I probably need to swap that round. And, yeah. yeah. Um, which I haven't read, so maybe I'll read that and yeah. you read Postcards yeah. and we'll swap. Um, I think I love, I love her. Oh, Nora Ephron, Heartburn. I ah, love yeah. that. That's, oh, that's I actually love... on top of my Wishful Drinking. <laughs> There's clearly a theme going on. I love, I love that writing. And to be honest, realistically, that is more the kind of book that I'm going to write. Like, um, I don't have the patience or the knowledge or the research for historical fiction, although I like to read it. Yeah. I'll never write sci-fi and fantasy because it's not particularly what I enjoy reading. What I like reading are books about, often about women or people um, behaving, you know, maybe not how society should expect them, and you know, talking out and being badly behaved, but, you know, badly behaved and drinking and taking drugs and making strange decisions. You know, they're the books that maybe because of my age and who I am, um, I relate to them, but they're the kind of books that, that I think I would probably write if I, if I would write that. And here's uh, another question. Uh, what's the, and there's a caveat here. What's um, the book that you are afraid that you will never read? It's not a book that you're not going to read because it just doesn't interest you or everyone else loves it, but you're thinking, nah, it's not for me. But a book that you think, oh, it, you know, it's like The Godfather because it's 400,000 pages or whatever. What's the book that you think, oh, I would quite like to read that, but I I might not get around to it. Is it? I was just thinking this this morning as I was looking at my bookshelf longingly um, is The Heart's Invisible Furies because I love John Boyne yeah. um, and is it The Heart's Invisible Furies? Hang on. Yes, because I read Ladder to the Sky um, last year and loved it by John Boyne and um, and I've got The Heart's Invisible Furies. My dad is my dad's copy in paperback and it's huge and I love his writing. I think, God, I'd love to, I'd love to read that book. I'm, you know, I often just pop a book in my bag and I'm not going to carry that around. I've got that back. <laughs> fair, um, fair. But I will, I will read it one day, but I'll probably be about 50 by the time I do. Yeah. So that uh, indicates that uh, this is a, this is a boring question. It's about 14 years out of date. Not a Kindle girl or, or is a I Kindle? I like a Kindle, yeah. Um, I prefer to read, I prefer to, I actually don't really mind, to be honest. I prefer to have a book. Yeah. Because also I'm better, I'm, I read faster on Kindle, um, but I probably read better on paper. Yeah. Um, but I also like audio books. I'm not really, I, I, the reason that I don't is because I don't want to be on my phone more than I really am, which is a lot. Um, so that's it really. And I, cause I use the Kindle app on my phone as well as, um, as well as my actual Kindle. So yeah, it's a, it's a, an, an addition, as you say, with um, audible books as well. It's a, a, a different way to approach a, a book, um, depending on what the location and the environment and, um, I'll often buy both. Yeah. You know, I'll buy the Kindle version and the paperback version so I can read the paperback version when I'm at home and the Kindle version when I'm out and about. Yeah. Well, excellent. Um, how? Uh, one last question then, because um, I think this is probably a, a better question to end on than a Kindle debate. How many books do you own? Probably. I'm just trying to do some maths in my head. 
probably about like well my I own my collection and I have a lot of my late mum's books yeah so my own ones that I own probably about 250 to 300 um and then probably another 250 of hers yeah it's but, a lot I've color coordinated them they look beautiful oh that yes that, it's a but, bit shallow, but they look great. There, there, are, there are going to be people who sort of uh, are really sort of enjoying the idea of calico and eighty books, and there are going to be people watching it who are just clenching and wincing at such a concept. So going, but also downstairs in the um, my mum's books are um, because she thought I was terribly shallow for color coordinating them. Hers are alphabetized, and I've re-alphabetized them yeah. in her in her wake. Um, but mine are color coordinated because um, I'm a awful millennial and it looks nice i'm, I'm just now in uh, if books are then color coordinated but you follow the narrative of what those books are they could be some nice sort of quite odd yeah. shifts in tone both color tone and, and I can find tone. quickly yeah because i'm a visual person i can find color like i could find a book i could find it instantly whereas downstairs it would take me ages to because i'd have to sing the alphabet a b c d e f g before i worked out what letter was before what letter yeah and if you start singing um a b c d and then switch into twinkle twinkle little star because it's basically the same thing the same tune then it can get, get very confusing i'm clearly very tired you can tell can't you um but um, anna thank you so much it's been a, a lovely to chat to you uh and we hope to chat to you again soon uh but have a good week have a great fantastic festival and uh we look forward to chatting to you again soon so. well thank you for having me and i'm really impressed at all these great things you and michelle are doing thank during you. lockdown thank you take care and be well so that was anna burt uh and we'll be back with you next week with another cast iron friday night interview Take care, be well.